Welcome back to Joy Even on Your Worst Day. Uh, at this time, we are uh, beginning at Philippians 1, beginning with the 27th verse, and Paul is getting to the meat of his message here. He, he says, Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So, when I was a kid, I went to church in a harness. I, my, my mom uh, had an infant in this arm and my brother on this hip, and I was free to roam. And I wasn't always the best behaved in church. And so to keep track of me, she put me in a harness. It went over my shoulders and around my waist and had a little leash on it. And I protested this. There was a season in my life where I said, Mom, I don't want to go to church. I don't like church. I don't want to go to church. She said, I completely understand. There are times I don't want to go either. Put your harness on. We're going to church. My wanting to go really had no bearing on the matter. You can see I obviously endured a very oppressive childhood. I remember those days now because now you can't keep me away. Church is sometimes hard. The church can sometimes disappoint you. The church can sometimes embarrass you. The church can sometimes uh, be annoying even. But the church has, for me, become my home. It is in church where I have most clearly seen persistent love and generous forgiveness. It's where I have witnessed resurrection and it is the people of the church who have taught me that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a whole mixed bag, but it is my home. And I think Paul understands it that way as well. He says, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. He uses a word here that he uses nowhere else in the New Testament. Uh, and the word for live your life is, it also means govern your life. It, it speaks of the commonwealth or the community. It means govern your life in a manner worthy. In other words, it's about how we are with one another. He's not saying you as an individual live your life worthy. He's saying you as a community, as a community, demonstrate the life of Christ. You know, to think of ourselves as part of a community is that there's a little bit of a prophetic word to our culture in this these days. James Davison Hunter, sociologist at the University of Virginia, he says, community is no longer natural in the postmodern world and will require an intentionality that is unfamiliar to most churches. What does he mean by that? I think he echoes what what David Brooks says when he speaks of radical individualism that defines our culture. We think of ourselves not as connected to one another, but as on our own. This has a long history and growing history with us. There was a 19th century philosopher, John Stuart Mill. In 1859, he penned a little book called On Liberty. And in that book, he offered his defense of freedom, his understanding of freedom. And what he said is for a person to truly be free, their choices have to be unencumbered, unrestrained. The choices have to be completely free. No restraints or constraints on the freedom of choice. Now, that sounds right, doesn't it? It's how we experience freedom, when I can choose what I want for myself. But think more deeply about that. The only way for your choices to be unencumbered, as Mill says, over my life I am sovereign, for the only way for my choices to be unencumbered is for me to not have any relationship that has an expectation of me. You can't be married and have your choices unencumbered. You, you can't be a parent. You can't be a friend. You can't, you can't be a Christian and have your choices unencumbered because by definition, being in relationship means that there is a commitment 
to one another. Uh, the central ethic of the Christian faith is to love and and love requires that there be another. You don't love in isolation. It's not a solo act. No, there has to be a relationship there. And if there's relationship, there's commitment. Our choices are influenced by that. That's not something to be afraid of. No, it's what makes us human. Paul says, I want you together to live your life in a way that is worthy of the gospel. But then he continues and he says, make my joy complete. This is in the second chapter, the second verse. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love. Be in full accord and of one mind. And later he says in verse 5, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Okay, what, what, what is this? Be of one mind? It sounds like the apostle thinks we can think the same things, that we can all get on the same page. That's not happening. The church has never been the church because we think alike. Think about your own family. You've had those Thanksgiving dinners that have blown up because crazy Uncle Eddie thinks the way he does. We don't all think alike. We never have, and we're never going to. What does he mean, be of one mind? Well, it's not a statement of the intellect. It's not a statement that we're going to have the same thing thoughts. Uh, the Greek word actually is translated better mindset or orientation, maybe even character. He said, he said, think the same way, not the same things. Have the same mindset or orientation. And what is that mindset? He says it is the mind of Christ. Well, what is that? Well, he tells us. He says, in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. And then, then he lifts up what we think was a hymn of the early church that sings of Christ's choice to, to come into this world. He said, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in human likeness and found in human form. He humbled himself. It's all through this passage. It is a spirit of humility. The mind of Christ is a spirit of humility. And humility is a tricky thing. And I, I've thought about humility in the wrong way for a long time. I, I, I was taught that humility is not thinking too highly of yourself. That, that humility was don't take up all the air in the room. Don't, don't puff yourself up. Don't think too highly of yourself. But I, I don't think that's quite it. I think humility is not how we think of ourselves at all. I think humility is probably a virtue or an orientation that we don't ever reach head on. I think humility results in how we see another. When we see the, the beauty of another, humility results. Th th this is what I mean. When I was in middle school, my dad came to me and he said, I'm going to let you stay up past your bedtime tonight because I want you to be awake when Johnny arrives. And I said, great. Johnny who? He said, Johnny Oates. I said, sure, Dad. Johnny Oates is coming to our house. He said, he'll be here tonight. He's going to be staying with us off and on for the next couple of months. Johnny Oates was the catcher for the Atlanta Braves. I was in middle school. My dad told me that a major league ball player was going to be living in my basement. Look, when you're a middle school kid and you've got a major league ball player in the basement, the second coming of Christ is anticlimactic. This is incredible. Well, sure enough, about midnight, a little sports car pulled in our driveway. He got out, no, no baseball cap, no catcher's mitt, no mask, no uniform, absolutely nothing to let my neighbors know there's a major league ball player in my driveway. But he comes to the back door, knocks on the door. I open the door and he said, you've got to be Tom. We sat down at our kitchen table and shared a piece of midnight pie and it was magical. 
He talked about catching the knuckleballer field Necro. He talked about being a teammate of Hank Aaron. It was a magical night. And then my dad turned into my dad. And he said, you know, John, Tom here, he's a pretty good ball player. He and, and Joe Riley, they turned a double play in Church League softball just last Tuesday. I said, Dad, stop, please. This is Johnny Oates. He's not going to be impressed with Church League softball. Now, look, here's the thing. If anybody else had been sitting at my table, I'd have been glad to tell them about how Joe and I turned that double play. It was pretty cool. But not now. Why? Because what I saw in Johnny Oates was something valuable. And I was humbled. Not because I was thinking less of myself, but because of the beauty I saw in him, the goodness I saw in him. He was not only a good ball player, he was a good man. You see, that's what Paul says about Christ. He humbled himself in coming to us. It's not that Jesus thought less of himself. It, it, it's not that he came as kind of an aw shucks kind of Lord. No. What brought him here, what humbled him, was a persistent love that could not bear to be away. He humbled himself because he sees the beauty, the value, the honor in you. Paul says, let that be your mindset. See the beauty in one another. So several years ago, uh, for Christmas, I got my kids a telescope. I was so excited about this. Uh, turns out I was the only one excited about it. They didn't care about it at all. Uh, so the good thing about that is I get plenty of opportunity to use the telescope to look at the night sky. And it's really quite astonishing. You look through that telescope and you wonder, how many stars are there out there? It's incredible. You know, astrophysicists are not even sure how many galaxies they are. there are. Some say they're between one and two trillion galaxies. The closest galaxy to us is the Andromeda galaxy, and it is two and a half million light years away. Two and a half million light years away. A light year is how far light travels in a year. So if it worked this way, light could circle the Earth seven and a half times in a second. So in a year, it goes like a long way. And there are the farthest galaxies from us in this ever-expanding universe are like 13 and a half billion light years away, which means some of the stars that we're seeing, they aren't there anymore. They burned up and died years ago. The light is just now reaching us. And how many stars are there? Some Estimate that some of the smaller galaxies may have as many as a trillion stars, and some of the larger galaxies maybe 10 trillion stars. Some estimate that in total, the universe may have as many as 300 sextillion stars. That's a three with 23 zeros. Some say it's a, it's a septillion stars. That's just add another zero. It's a lot of stars. And here's the point. The God who fashioned that ever-expanding universe not only looked down through all of that to find this little blue dot that is our home, but came to us with a love that calls us by name, humbled himself with a love that calls us by name, that love that could not bear to be away. And that God, that love, Paul says, is our home. Rest in that and rejoice.